it's pretty hard to do a video about a topic that doesn't have any visual resources to speak of, but this is a topic that I do want to discuss, so gather round for a story about Wizards of the Coast. In particular, their multiple attempts to create English exclusive sets within the Pokemon TCG. So Wizards held the license to print and distribute the Pokemon TCG from 1998 to 2002, so any English card that was released and distributed, it was through Wizards of the Coast. Wizards already had a ton of experience because they created Magic the Gathering and basically built that company from the ground up in printing and distributing Magic the Gathering cards. And talking about Wizards of the Coast can be a little bit controversial in the way they handled the Pokemon TCG because at times it did seem that they were trying to twist it to be more like Magic. If you go back and look at the official rulings compendium for a base set through Skyridge, you'll see a lot of incorrect rulings in there where they weren't really understanding the basic mechanics of the Pokemon TCG and they were applying the mechanics of Magic and using those rulings to dictate how Pokemon was supposed to be played. So there was quite a bit of a disconnect between Wizards of the Coast and the Pokemon Company. And to exacerbate this, the Pokemon Company in Japan was just tossing out sets. They had so many Japanese exclusive sets and Wizards of the Coast had to request to receive those sets and translate them to distribute them and sell them in North America. To this day, there are still some Japanese sets that were never released outside of Japan, like the Versus series, the Vending series, and a ton of movie promos. Another disconnect came in the form of competitive play, where Wizards of the Coast had set up a standard format and an extended format for TCG play, while in Japan, it was basically just unlimited. At that time, every card that had been printed was fair game, so this disconnect even affected the way that Pokemon players were experiencing the game. Even this early on, it became clear that Wizards of the Coast was wanting to kind of veer off and do their own thing and create their own version of the Pokemon TCG in North America. Their first step in doing so was creating Base Set 2, which was not a set that was released in Japan. They did get permission to reprint cards from Base Set and Jungle into a brand new set, basically to resell more packs and introduce new players to those base set cards that were a little bit harder to get a hold of. Wizards did maintain the rights to distribution from the Pokemon Company well into the gold and silver sets, and around the time that Neo Discovery was coming out, they announced that they were gonna do a base set three. And I was only able to find information on Base Set 3 by digging through interviews on the old, old Pojo's website where they did have a representative from Wizards of the Coast answering questions about upcoming TCG sets. In this interview, the representative refers to this Base Set 3 as Cross Trainer. So this Cross Trainer set was supposed to include all 151 Pokemon, one representative of each, from sets ranging from base set all the way up through Rocket. Among these 151 Pokemon cards were supposed to be previously unreleased in English cards that were to be translated from the Japanese Vending series and the Japanese Southern Island sets, which Wizards of the Coast did not have the licensing rights to publish. Jump ahead several months to another Pojo interview with the same representative, when they were asked about the Cross Trainer set, their response was simply that it wasn't going to happen anymore, that Wizards of the Coast would rather focus on translating and releasing Neo Revelation and the Southern Island sets. While not stated directly by either company, it does seem likely that the Pokemon Company basically rejected the idea of Cross Trainer and did not allow them to reproduce these Japanese exclusive cards in a brand new English exclusive set, but instead it seems that as a consolation prize, Wizards of the Coast was given the rights to translate and distribute the Southern Islands, which they did. What did end up happening was Legendary Collection, which is a watered down version of what Wizards of the Coast seemed to be going for with the Cross Trainer set. In a way, Wizards did kind of get what they wanted with Legendary Collection as they were able to reprint some base through Rocket cards and make that part of the brand new Neo On format and bring those cards back into standard play, which again, Wizards of the Coast had created specifically for American audiences for the Pokemon TCG. Jump ahead again to the e-reader era. So Sky Ridge is about to come out 
the representative from Wizards of the Coast does some more Pojo interviews and announces not one, but two Wizards of the Coast exclusive sets, the first of which being Legendary Collection 2 and another unnamed wizard set. At the point in time when these interviews were being posted, Wizards of the Coast did not have the rights to produce Pokemon cards after Sky Ridge was released. So it does make sense that they would want to reprint cards that they already had the license to and try to make a little bit more money off of selling packs since they weren't sure if they were going to be able to continue the license once the Ruby and Sapphire sets were released. Over the course of these several Wizard interviews on the Pojo website, the representative reveals that Wizards had already contacted multiple artists to do original artwork for brand new Pokemon cards that they were going to create and produce. They also said that they had already created promo art, box art, packaging designs, and had already invested a considerable amount of time and money into the research and development of this set that they were now going to call Jamboree. Jamboree was to be the pinnacle of Wizards of the Coast run on the Pokemon TCG just in case they weren't going to get that license back. They wanted to go out on a high note. And it wasn't entirely unreasonable for Wizards to create their own brand new Pokemon cards as they had done it before. With the Rocket set, Dark Raichu was included as a secret rare. That's why it's numbered 83 out of 82. This is a card that the Japanese Rocket set did not include. Now, Wizards of the Coast did not create their own artwork for this card, they just repurposed Rachu art that already existed. But Dark Rachu still served as an example that Wizards of the Coast had created their own cards before, and the Pokemon Company allowed it to happen. But as all of you in the TCG community know, Legendary Collection 2 never happened. Jamboree never happened, and it was swept under the rug pretty hard. So much so that the only way to find information on it was to dig through some pretty archaic forum posts from 2002. To illustrate how quickly this turnaround actually happened, here are some select quotes from the Pojo interviews that I keep mentioning. This post started in January 3rd of 2002, where Wizards of the Coast seemingly announces that they are working on a Wizards-only TCG set, and makes it appear as though the Pokemon Company was actually encouraging this. By February 2002, they had already given names to not only Legendary Collection 2, but Jamboree. And they did reveal in a later post that the cards would not be e-reader format like the Sky Ridge set was. In an official release, not a forum interview, we do have word from Wizards of the Coast that they will not be distributing the Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire TCG releases that the Pokemon Company will be taking over from there, but they are still on the books, officially announcing that they will be releasing a Legendary Collection 2 and a Jamboree expansion set, which does not happen. Later, we get this Pojo post saying that Legendary Collection 2 and Jamboree are officially canceled now, and they are questioning Master Trainer Mike on how far along the sets were, what cards were included, will they ever be released, and they have to be pretty hush about this because they no longer have a deal with Nintendo or the Pokemon Company. Even at this point, players were considering how this would affect the metagame and how this would affect official events because those events were sanctioned and controlled by Wizards of the Coast. It does become a little difficult to read between the lines and try to figure out what was actually going on here. You could interpret it as Wizards of the Coast was getting a little too big for their britches. They were wanting to release their own Pokemon sets, kind of drift away and do their own thing differently from the Pokemon Company. And it's understandable why that would be frowned upon by the company that actually makes and produces and controls the Pokemon TCG and why they would sever that contract and not renew Wizards of the Coast for the Gen 3 releases. At the same time, I can understand why the Pokemon Company would want to take back control of North American distribution and try to make a cohesive worldwide standard for the format and for organized play. Because at this point, the TCG had blown up. It had gone way beyond just collectible cards. There was a huge competitive scene for this and the direction that they were heading was going to become more and more competitive and focus more on how each new wave of cards and all the new mechanics they had planned on adding would affect organized gameplay. In the next year, when Wizards of the Coast deal was finally expiring, we got some juicy tidbits about some behind the scenes motivators in these decisions and posts. 
The distribution deal between the Pokemon Company and Wizards ended on September 30th of 2003, and on October 1st, 2003, Wizards of the Coast filed a lawsuit against the Pokemon Company. Wizards claimed that the release of Legendary Collection 2 and potentially Jamboree hinged upon the release of confidential information that Wizards had about Pokemon players. It also seems as though the Pokemon Company did poach employees from Wizards of the Coast and bring them onto their own team in order to develop new sets for the Ruby and Sapphire expansions. In doing so, the Pokemon Company could have obtained proprietary information that could have been used to compete with Wizards' own Magic the Gathering products. I'll link this article about the lawsuit down in the description so that you can read it in full if you're interested. What I'm interested in hearing is opinions down in the comments about what you think was actually going on here. Would you have liked to have seen Legendary Collection 2 and Jamboree sets? I know that I would be really interested in seeing what cards were actually going to make it into each set, although I'm not a big fan of re-release sets. I know that collectors love Legendary Collection for whatever reasons, but I was never that big on it, so I wouldn't really care if they ever got released or not. But overall, do you agree with me that Wizards of the Coast did tend to mishandle the Pokemon TCG at times and that it's probably for the best that those rights reverted to the Pokemon Company for a worldwide distribution? This is a topic that I want to continue to pursue to get more information because I do want to know all the juicy little details about what was going on. Maybe this video somehow makes its way to Master Trainer Mike or Wizards of the Coast Keith or anyone else at Wizards that would have information on this topic. If you do, hit me up because I would love to learn more about what was going on back in 2002. For everyone else, I hope you enjoyed this video, even though there wasn't a whole lot of video going on, but I do hope you liked the discussion. Stay tuned for the next video and some more upcoming decks, and until then, bye!